Good morning, honorable members. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. As we begin our devotions this morning with our Moments of Impact segment, I want to share on this subject briefly that I've been mulling over for the last several days. And it's simply entitled, Anchored in God. If there's ever time we need to be anchored in God, it is now. Sadly, many people in our world today are anchored in the wrong things. There are those who are anchored in their wealth. And of course, FTX taught us that your financial status can change overnight. There are those who are anchored in people. I think all of us would agree that the arms of flesh will fail you and you dare not trust your own. People will celebrate you today and crucify you by this afternoon. Thankfully, we serve a God, according to Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, who changeth not. The God we serve is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There is a clarion call going out to all and sundry under the sound of my voice today to get anchored in God. To be anchored in God means that your commitment to him is unwavering and resolute despite what you're facing. There was a young man by the name of Joseph in the Bible who represents the epitome of what it means to be anchored in God. Joseph, you would know, was hated by his brothers because of the favor of his earthly father and a dream placed in his heart by his heavenly father. Because of their hatred for Joseph, they conspired to slay him. They betrayed him. They staged his death. They lied on him. They dug a pit for him. They sold him to the Midianites. The Midianites sold him to Potiphar. Potiphar's wife made false rape allegations against Joseph. Joseph also was placed in prison. Despite all of what Joseph went through, he remained anchored in God. He maintained his standards and his posture in God. Because he remained anchored in God, God delivered him from everyone who sought to bring him harm to his life and made him the second in charge in all of Egypt. As the second in command, Joseph became like the governor responsible for the affairs of the land. The same brothers who tried to kill him now had to provide food for them during famine. The moral of this story today is that no matter what people try to do to you, if you remain anchored in God, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. In my conclusion, I want to read one stanza and the chorus of a song written by Ruth Kai Jones entitled, In Times Like These. In times like these, we need a savior. In times like these, we need an anchor. Be very sure, be very sure, your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. This rock is Jesus. Yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure. Be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. Selah, think and act on these things. Let us pray. Father, we lift up your name today. You are the King of kings and you are the Lord of lords. We thank you for the gift of life. Lord, we don't take for granted our space in the earth. We commit today afresh to you, to serve you, to live for you and to become everything you've created us to be. Father, rid us of all distractions that seek to pull us away from you. Help us to keep our trust in you and in you alone. Help us to remain anchored in you as our rock and our strong tower. Father, I speak blessings today over each of these honorable members in this house and those who are not here today. I ask you graciously, Father, to cover them and to protect them and to fill their minds with godly wisdom as they seek to lead this nation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let us repeat the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Morris. Good morning, honorable members. At the suspension, we were at number six on the order of business, statement and communication by ministers. I presume you're now ready. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Carmichael. Good morning, Madam Speaker, honorable members. Good morning. Madam Speaker, I wish to begin by thanking the almighty God for allowing me the opportunity to stand in this honorable place once again on behalf of the wonderful, wonderful people of Carmichael and Bahamians everywhere. Madam Speaker, just over a year ago, I accepted an invitation from the honorable member of Cat Island, Ramkey, and San Salvador, the honorable prime minister, to join his cabinet as the minister with responsibility for labor and immigration. In accepting this charge, I committed to the honorable prime minister, my cabinet colleagues, my party, and indeed all Bahamians, that I would commit myself to fully implementing our government's mandate in the Ministry of Labor and Immigration. Madam Speaker, in our blueprint for change, my party committed to introduce immigration reforms to protect the sovereignty of our Bahamas. At the outset, Madam Speaker, let me say that the Progressive Liberal Party government was, remains, and by the grace of God, shall forever be the government that puts Bahamians first. We are the government that puts the interests of Bahamians first. We are the government of Bahamianization. We are the government which saw the need to defend our borders and created the Royal Bahamas Defense Force. We are the government that oversaw the largest capital investment in the Royal Bahamas Police Defense Force in our history, again to protect our borders. We are the government that has been consistent and unwavering in our core values and beliefs that Bahamians must come first in the Bahamas. Madam Speaker, over the past months, there has been significant discourse in the public domain regarding immigration. Increasingly, much of it surrounds migrants from the Republic of Haiti. At this present time, Madam Speaker, we are faced with an influx of Cubans and Haitians who are intercepted in our waters. Cuba is experiencing the worst economic crisis in 30 years. The pandemic follows followed has played a major role in food shortages, which, has compounded, which is compounded by rising inflation and trade embargoes. Haiti continues to experience widespread violence and political instability. Haitians have faced a surge of gang attacks, kidnappings, fuel and electricity shortages, a deepening of political deadlock, and a deadly outbreak of cholera. The Ukrainian war has exasperated the economic and supply issues in both Cuba and Haiti as the reduction in Ukrainian resources has triggered a significant increase in the cost of food worldwide. Madam Speaker, it is our prayer that the international community would assemble the resources needed to provide Haiti and Cuba with an economic package of debt forgiveness and aid to assist in improving an economic outlook for their country. It is only with a strong international response led by the world's great economies that the conditions in these countries will improve, which would reduce the numbers of economic migrants seeking to leave these countries. Our Prime Minister, Honorable Madam Speaker, understands this imperative and has been working with the United States and CARICOM on these issues. Just yesterday, the Honorable Prime Minister would have met with the Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris, at the White House, to discuss such matters of mutual interest, including the importance of strengthening efforts to combat illegal maritime migration. Madam Speaker, whilst we hope and pray that the international community provides assistance to Haiti and Cuba, we must continue to protect our borders and the Bahamas and enforce our immigration laws. When one refers to irregular or illegal migrants, Madam Speaker, it often stirs up emotional responses. There are fears of job loss, overpopulation in our, in our urban areas, substandard housing, 
overflows in our clinic, and of course, medical facilities, and overcrowding in our schools. These concerns are all valid, and it is an irrefutable fact that the Bahamas cannot accept ever-increasing numbers of migrants without a corresponding deterioration of the quality of life for us all. This is why it is the position of this government that whilst those who enter the Bahamas legally are welcome, unlawful entrants are not. I therefore issue a stern warning to all those living illegally in this country to wind up your affairs and leave immediately. Madam Speaker, the Bahamas is a small island state whose population is less than half a million people. Our country is spread over 100,000 square miles of land and sea. To the southwest of us lies the Republic of Cuba, with a population of over 11 million people. To the south of us lies the Republic of Haiti, with a population of over 12 million people. That's over 23 million persons. For decades, we have been challenged by significant volumes of persons seeking to unlawfully enter our shores from both countries, placing an enormous burden on us. Madam Speaker, on the 21st of March, 2022, Human Rights Watch reported that from the 1st of January, 2021, through the 26th of February, 2022, data collected by the International Organization of Migration showed that some 20,309 people were expelled or deported to Haiti from the United States. During that same period, Madam Speaker, the Bahamas, like its northern neighbor, continued the process and repatriate economic migrants and irregular entrants. Madam Speaker, the reality for us here in the Bahamas is that our resources are limited and we are simply not capable of absorbing these persons into our, into our society. We cannot do more. Just for the past week, Madam Speaker, 94 Haitian nationals were received from the Royal Bahamas Defense Force, having been found in Ragged Island. 17 Cuban nationals were received from the Liberty of the Seas cruise ship. Nine Cuban nationals were transported to Nassau from Bimini after being rescued by sea by local fishermen. Five Haitian nationals were brought in from Inagua, having been found in the area of Matthew Town. Madam Speaker, our response is and must continue to be to ensure that economic migrants and unlawful entrants are expeditiously processed and deported from the Bahamas. This process is consistent with the policies and procedures adopted by our neighboring countries, who are far better resourced to provide economic and other humanitarian assistance to the republics of Haiti and Cuba. Madam Speaker, statistics from the Department of Immigration show significant increases in the number of migrants intercepted in the past two years. In 2021, 226 Cubans were intercepted and repatriated from the Bahamas. In 2022, this number jumped by almost 800 to 1,001 Cubans. Our records also reveal that we experienced the same jump in irregular migrants from Haiti. In 2021, whereas 2,219 Haitians were repatriated, in 2022, we saw an increase of over 1,100 persons when 3,349 persons were repatriated. It would be remiss of me, Madam Speaker, if I did not point out that we are not only receiving irregular migrants from Cuba and Haiti. The Department of Immigration also repatriated 12 Americans, 13 Venezuelans, 14 Brazilians, 26 Colombians, 58 Dominicans, 66 Ecuadorians, and of course, 125 Jamaicans. As a member of the United Nations and the International Organization for Migration, the Bahamas is obligated to treat all persons who enter our borders with compassion, dignity, and basic human respect. All irregular migrants, no matter from which country they hail, are afforded access to all legal and humanitarian rights. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, I believe that in light of the rhetoric and untruths circulating on social media, it is important to emphasize that the Ministry and the Department of Immigration, in, collaborate, in collaboration with our local and international law enforcement and social partners, undertook the largest number of repatriations in the history of the Bahamas last year. In 2022, a total of 4,748 persons were repatriated from the Bahamas. Madam Speaker, our aggressive efforts to protect our borders and deport those persons who enter our country illegally 
have not ceased in 2023. On January 1st, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 10th, and 12th, repatriation exercises were conducted to Haiti, Cuba, and Jamaica. On January 5th alone, 159 persons were placed before the magistrate's court for various offenses. 115 Cubans and 42 Haitian nationals, all of whom were convicted and are currently serving time at the Department of the Bahamas Department of Correctional Services. Madam Speaker, just Friday past, some 122 Haitian nationals, comprising 97 males and 37 females and one minor child, was repatriated to Haiti. A group of some 50 Cubans were intercepted at Anguilla Key and are currently in our custody. A joint operation at Marshall Road, New Providence, foiled a smuggling attempt and, and, and the arrest of some seven persons. Today, as I stand before this honorable chamber, a total of 98 persons of, are being put before mm -hmm. the court. These persons coming from Haiti, Jamaica, Guyana, Colombia, Colombia, and Cuba are being taken before our courts for various infractions of the immigration laws. This is the result from sustained operations by the Department of Immigration and our law enforcement partners. These persons were arrested in New Providence, Ragged Island, Eleuthera, Bimini, Inagua, and Andros. Madam Speaker, the government of the Bahamas is firm in its resolves to fight illegal migration, immigration. A major concern remains our human resource. Hence, in November 2022, our government recruited the largest immigration squad in the history of immigration. Madam Speaker, let me also say that in, in, in recruiting this squad, it represents an increase of some 30% of the immigration staff to date. Madam Speaker, these officers have now been deployed throughout the Bahamas, and the public will continue to see the benefits of this investment in personnel with reduced wait times, more investigations, more special operations, and of course, great efficiency. Madam Speaker, it is my intention to seek the approval of my government to recruit another immigration squad in the not too distant future. Over the past months, Madam Speaker, the department has undertaken special immigration operations throughout New Providence and on Abaco without fanfare and notice to the public. These operations have resulted in undocumented and unlawful entrants being taken into custody and repatriated. Cases of fraud were also detected and such violators have been placed before the courts and are currently at Bahamas Department of Correctional Services. Madam Speaker, to reduce the time required for persons intercepted in the Southern Bahamas to be returned to their home countries, we have established a temporary holding facility in Inagua with two 3,600 square feet tents. Our goal is to ensure that irregular migrants found and intercepted in the Southern Bahamas would be repatriated from that island without having to come all the way here to New Providence. Madam Speaker, while there is significant focus on undocumented irregular migrants, it is also important to note a number of issues and trends concerning lawful migrants which are not permissible and will not be tolerated. Work permits, Madam Speaker, are issued to an employer for whom the employee must work. Work permit holders are not allowed to freelance and engage in work outside of the, out of the employer who obtained the permit in accordance with the terms of the permit. If a permit is obtained for a gardener, the person must be a gardener for the employer who obtained the permit. Immigration has stepped up its investigations department where persons are found violating the terms of their permits, the permits will be revoked, and the permit holder will be prosecuted and deported. Employers who obtain permits under false pretenses will be prosecuted, and no further applications for permits will be approved by that employer, for that employer. I encourage all Bahamians, therefore, to abide by the laws of our land. Stop harboring and hiring illegal migrants. Those persons who have approvals for work permits to hire migrants, please ensure that the work permit is renewed and all fees are paid on an annual basis. Madam Speaker, we must also be reminded that the public, that for our immigration policies to be successful, the public must continue to partner with the department in doing its part. Each time you hire an undocumented person or a person who has no right to work independently, you erode the work we are doing. Each time you submit a false application for a work permit to the department, 
you take an opportunity away from a citizen. Each time you harbor an undocumented person, you make it harder for the department to carry its mandate. Each time you turn a blind eye to persons breaking our immigration laws and choose not to report the matters, you help to erode the ability to regulate and control immigration. Madam Speaker, let me emphasize that the role of immigration is to protect our borders from economic migrants and unlawful entrants. The Royal Bahamas Defense Force and the United States Coast Guard continue to provide valuable assistance in capturing those who attempt to sail through our territorial waters. And Madam Speaker, let me indicate that I am pleased that according to the information I have in my possession, I'm sure I'll be supported by the Minister himself of National Security, that no illegal vessel has been successful in entering our borders without being intercepted by the Royal Bahamas Defense Force or the U.S. Coast Guard. In addition to that, Madam Speaker, I can report that the U.S. Coast Guard and the Defense Force have also foiled a number of smuggling, human smuggling operations leaving the Bahamas and persons trying to enter the United States. The Department of Immigration, Madam Speaker, will continue to partner with the Bahamian people in the struggle with irregular migration. However, it must be done in a responsible, genuine manner. Madam Speaker, but I believe that I speak with one voice for all in this honorable place, that we remain committed to the protection of our sovereignty and our immigration laws. This statement is important as across the world, we have seen the dangers of the fall of the rise of fringe groups and their campaigns of misinformation. Campaigns which seek to divide and not unite, to destroy and not to build. Madam Speaker, the dangers I speak of is not a theoretical debate, but a real one. A few weeks ago, we saw the entrance of this place obstructed as crowds gathered, having been told by mem some members that the country was for sale and that we were out to pass laws in a secret. This was pure nonsense, yet dozens of persons surrounded this place convinced of the untruths. A few days ago, a well-known personality created a video seen by thousands both here and internationally, claiming that a shanty town existed on Paradise Island filled with unlawful migrants. Madam Speaker, investigations by both the Department of Immigration and the police confirm that the claim was completely false. The area the commentator called the shanty town was two apartments within a larger complex, each occupied by a husband, a wife, and children. Nonetheless, just yesterday, dozens gathered again convinced that Paradise Island was being overrun by shanty towns. Madam Speaker, we live in a global community, and we are a tourist nation. How could it benefit this country for behemoths to promote stories that are untrue, which have the capacity to chase away tourists? Madam Speaker, we have many legitimate issues which we can discuss and debate. There is no need to manufacture issues. There is no place in this country, Madam Speaker, for xenophobia and making reports that have no reasonable basis. The Department of Immigration has two hotlines. Numbers, the numbers are 604-0172, I repeat, 604-0172, and the other number is 604-0196, 604-0196, which are manned by the investigation section of the department. Six officers are assigned to man these phones 24-7 and also conduct complaints. The public is therefore encouraged to make use of our hotline as well as our website, which is immigration.gov.bs. Look under the tab, contact us. Madam Speaker, over the past decades, successive governments have struggled in restricting the creation and expansion of irregular communities. This is the most serious issue and one which the public rightly demands the government to remedy. The Honorable Minister with Responsibility for Works and Utilities is assiduously working in his ministry's plan to address this long-standing issue. In the upcoming weeks and months, the Department of Immigration, for its part, will increase the numbers of special operations occurring and the number of investigations for the following. One, to ensure that all persons living in such communities have legal status in this country, and two, confirm that any permit holder living in such communities is doing so in accordance with the terms of their application. If you have obtained a work permit on the basis of providing housing for a worker, 
it must be housing that complies with all our laws and regulations. If you have applied for a living employee, the person must live at your address and not at an irregular community. We have found such permits will be revoked. Additionally, Madam Speaker, the Department is presently reviewing our policies to strengthen our investigation and confirmation of the living conditions of all work permit holders. All persons holding work permits in this country must comply with our laws and regulations, including all our building codes, health and sanitary sanitation requirements. Where it is shown that the holder of a work permit is living in an irregular community or in other conditions which do not comply with our building or public health guidelines, such permits will be revoked and the holders deported. Let me emphasize, Madam Speaker, that the Bahamas is a country governed by the rule of law, not hearsay. We have always been characterized as a friendly, peaceful Christian nation. Xenophobia and hateful speech do not and should not represent who we are. Madam Speaker, I wish to emphasize that I have expressed concern on the sharp increase in this context of how we treat irregular and regular migrants coming into our country. For example, in the recent voyage where some 90 plus persons were taken in custody, there was a three month old child as part of that voyage. That person, along with some 17 children, are currently in our custody. And we are seeking, Madam Speaker, to repatriate those persons as quickly as possible. Nonetheless, Madam Speaker, the government of the Bahamas is resolute in its commitment to protect our borders and to remove unlawful entrance to the Bahamas. Over the upcoming weeks and months, more special operations will be conducted and irregular migrants will be prosecuted and deported. These operations may result in some inconveniences to the public and I ask for your tolerance. Madam Speaker, the Department of Immigration processes are being reviewed to ensure that instances of fraud and deceit are reduced to an absolute minimum. Fees are being reviewed to better align them with the costs associated with the work of the department. Laws are being reviewed to ensure that the fines and prison sentences are sufficient to punish those who violate our immigration laws. Madam Speaker, I accept that we will be measured by our work, our results, and not our speeches. The Department of Immigration is committed to doing the work needed to deliver the results to that of the behemoth that they demand. As minister with responsibility for labor and immigration, if you are an illegal migrant living on New Providence, Abaco, Eleuthera, Harbor Island, Grand Bahama, or anywhere else in this archipelago, you must leave. You must immediately wind up your affairs and leave the Bahamas voluntarily. Failure to do so will lead to your arrest, prosecution, deportation, and placement on a restricted list, which will completely bar you from any future entry into this country. Madam Speaker, I close by thanking the team at the Department and the Ministry of Immigration, our police and defense force, our local fishermen, our general public, social services, and all our international partners for all their work in protecting our borders and enforcing our immigration laws and policies. Madam Speaker, the Bahamas maintains an organized system to allow for the lawful entry and orderly processing of applications for lawful entry into the Bahamas. This is the only process by which persons should enter this country. Madam Speaker, may God continue to bless, preserve, and keep our government. Thank you, Honorable Member. Order that the communication be brought up. Order the document to lie on the table. For the laying of the chair recognizes the honorable member for West Grand Bahama in the uh, Madam Speaker, one week ago yesterday, the people of the Bahamas observed the anniversary of majority rule, that seminal moment 56 years ago, when the people took a progressive step 
toward self-determination. Madam Speaker, the journey to that historical day, the crowning jewel of the quiet revolution, was punctuated by events that now represent the history of the journey of the quiet revolution. Madam Speaker, 65 years ago today would have been the sixth day of the general strike. The strike began on January 12th. The workers of the Bahamas echoed the words, no sweat, as they rested down their labor in support of the taxi drivers. The occasion was the opening of the Nassau International Airport. The Bay Street Boys had suddenly formed tour companies. They received exclusive arrangements to transport tourists. The protest, led by Sir Clifford Darling, then a taxi driver, lasted 19 days. The impact of the strike led Secretary to the Colonies, Alan Lennox Boyd, to agree to the abolition of the company vote, cessation of voters' privilege to vote in every constituency, limitation of the poll vote now to two, the addition of four new constituencies in New Providence, and universal adult suffrage. The general strike, therefore, was a fundamental step on the journey to majority rule and the road to 50. Madam Speaker, we salute the taxi drivers and workers of the Bahamas. Another important step happened on January 19th, 1959. That would be tomorrow. Madam Speaker, tomorrow will mark the 64th anniversary of the day when Dame Doris Johnson demanded the attention of the legislature. She had become the voice of the women's suffragettes movement and requested permission to address the legislature. She was denied, but through an arrangement, she would do so in the magistrate's court. Hence, one of the greatest moments on the journey to self-determination. We salute the women of the suffragettes movement and all women who are continuing in the revolution. Madam Speaker, the road to 50 is filled with moments and events that are reflective of the blood, the sweat, and the tears of the leaders who, in the words of Selinden Penley, determined to lifting up the common man, struggling for full human rights and complete deliverance from the repression of colonial status. Madam Speaker, the pantheon of men and women of the quiet revolution will always be the true heroes and heroines on the march on the road to 50. The revolution continues. Thank you, Honorable Member. Order that the document be brought up. Order the document to lie on the table. For the statement and communications? The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Marco City. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, there are numerous events leading up to the establishment of majority rule that contributed mightily to the eventual milestone being reached and subsequently etched in law. The backdrop against which these events unfolded must, however, be reframed in the modern Bahamas. In short, Madam Speaker, the decades of struggle was engaged in by both black and white Bahamians and others from other jurisdictions. It was engaged in by poor and rich. PLPs and others, including those that form the Free National Movement, by young and old Bahamians alike. The achievement of majority rule was a momentous historical event, but it was also an aspirational event. There was then and now an expectation 
that this achievement would deepen our democracy, increase citizens' participation in governance, and empower our people regardless of their socioeconomic status. The fact is the Burma Road riots on June 1, 1942 was not the start, but a continuation of rebellion against a pattern of economic racism that saw the majority of Bahamians disadvantaged in the workplace by developers who allowed, were allowed to bring in labor from elsewhere, especially Cuba and the United States. These developers, Madam Speaker, and their facilitators in the government system permitted foreign labor access to work that Bahamians were well capable of doing and at better wages. This was the state of affairs, Madam Speaker, for decades. And the reversal of this national tragedy required the political and economic change our people fought for. Against this backdrop, it can be said that the march toward majority rule required passing the checkpoint, the milestone of equal pay for equal labor. Our struggle for majority rule was greatly assisted by the women suffrage movement in the Bahamas, wherein women in the Bahamas inspired uh, not only by the international movement for women's empowerment, but also by the Burma Road Rise, by the labor movement and the 1958 general strike, positioned women to work extremely hard along with others to throw off the shackles of disenfranchisement and demanded their rights to vote in general elections. And so, as we celebrate majority rule, we also celebrate that great alliance of Bahamian suffragettes, presided over by Mary Ingram and freedom fighters such as Georgiana Simonette, Eugenia Lockhart, Altier Mortimer, Alberta Isaacs, Dame Dr. Doris Johnson, Grace Wilson, Mildred Moxie, Ethel Kemp, Gladys Bailey, Una Prosper Hasty, Veronica Lockmore, Nora Hanna, Marge Brown, and others. These women and their allies, propelled by the civil rights awakening, saw their rights as Bahamians being denied and determined that they would work assiduously to rectify this historical wrong. Both in 1961 and manifested in 1962, the meaningful change came. The march to majority rule demanded that we pass that milestone, that important milestone where every citizen got a chance to have their say. One vote for each man and each woman alike. Another major plank in this bridge to majority rule was the formation of the country's first political party, the Progressive Liberal Party. In August 1953, publisher, real estate broker, and member of the House of Assembly for Kett Island, William Cartwright, reportedly invited to the first meeting on Bay Street and Frederick Street the following men, the Honorable Charles Rodriguez, Henry Milton Taylor, Cyril St. John Stevenson, Samuel Carey, Holly Brown, Clement Pinder, F. W. Russell, and others. I'm advised, Madam Speaker, that white and black folks facilitated the formation of the PLP, contrary to some revisionists who placed the historical fact, these historical facts, in a context that allowed them to suck every bit of credit they can get out of it today. Nevertheless, the PLP was designed to represent all that was opposed to unfair privilege and the wealth and power privilege afforded the Bay Street Boys and their facilitators. The view then was that someone must stand up against those things that were absolutely wrong in our national life. Madam Speaker, another pivotal event, event in the march to majority rule was the general strike of 1958, which brought the capital to a virtual standstill 
as nearly every worker participated in a peaceful withdrawal of their labor. This led, Madam Speaker, to the trade union and, of course, the Industrial Conciliation Act and the setting up of a labor department. In the context of our discussion today, it is vital to note that it was in 1958, Madam Speaker, that Alan Lennox Boyd, Secretary of State, this is among the others, for the colonies, ordered the first constitutional steps to be taken toward majority rule. The voting franchise was extended to all males, whether they were landowners or not. The once unlimited plural vote was ordered to be reduced to two, and the abolition of the company vote was abolished. It was ordered. The joinee picked up momentum, Madam Speaker, with the enfranchisement of women and the events of Black Tuesday, ending the election result, ending in the election result on January 10, 1967, majority rule. While the PLP and the oligarch backed UBP was tied with 18 seats apiece. It was the weight of labor representative, Sir Randall Fox. And as we talk about Sir Randall, we also pay tribute to Sir Alvin Brennan, who both tossed their support behind the Progressive Liberal Party and allowed the PLP to form the country's first ever black-led government. Sir Randall Fox proved that one voice can make a difference. While majority rule is to have, while majority rule was ushered in really by a collective, the reality is, Madam Speaker, it was designed in many ways to inspire the next generation. We in church right now, my brother. Madam Speaker, majority rule provides Bahamians with an opportunity to make fundamental adjustments in our constitution as was desired then, in our political and social and cultural and economic life. The reality is that in the modern Bahamas, persons often question to what extent does the majority actually influence the rule in this country. This question, Madam Speaker, is rooted in the day-to-day -day experience of ordinary Bahamians. There are still some and new old oligarchies whose backs are not yet broken. Instead, some of these white and black groups continue to carve out significant portions of our patrimony for themselves to the detriment of new entrepreneurs. When Bahamians look around the modern Bahamas, it is sometimes difficult to see how it could be true that the majority of our citizens are determining our course and benefiting from our wealth. Unemployment last year sat at more than 13.2%, up from 2017, when it was just under 10%. The gross national income per capita in the Bahamas from 2011 to 2021 have remained more or less stagnant around 28,000 per year. Far too often, if we meet more often, we could talk about a lot more issues. Far too often, many Bahamians seek access to agriculture and agriculture land, crown land for entrepreneurial pursuits and are rebuffed or stalled while the wealthy or immigrants and some lawless Bahamians occupy land illegally with too little consequences. Majority Rule Day marks a pivotal step in our collective journey to lock in the universal value of one person, one vote, which gives us a chance to choose a group of men and women who hold on to national power in trust, in trust for the masses. Daily, we must exercise our authority to return this power to the people through legislation, policies, programs, and projects, Madam Speaker. 
What we must now do is continue to form the mechanisms that transform this public advocacy into policies and laws where appropriate. The labor movement and civil society together and separately have led in this area and are to be applauded for their work and to advance in uh, their work to advance our national culture. Madam Speaker, stakeholders must constantly communicate with each other to harness the power that collective action delivers. This is where the government must step in and lead. The majority must be a check on the elected and the appointed so that they, that we do not abuse this power and privilege of trust. One voice can make a difference. It is in this spirit that I encourage myself on our side and all concerned to remember the milestone, the milestones of majority rule. January 10th captures a date, but majority rule was and is a journey for all of us. Majority rule is not a static event in history. Majority rule is an ever evolving ongoing work that we as a nation are engaged in together. And we must all participate and give the best of ourselves. And to paraphrase Lerone Bennett, let us erase the historical biases without introducing new biases. Let us each rededicate ourselves to making the Bahamas the best country it can be. Happy majority rule. Thank you, Honorable Member. Order did the document be brought up? Order that the document lie on the table. I would wish to point out that communications are not intended to be controversial. And uh, we are reminded, and we're reminded by the side opposite. And so to hear the member from Marco City this morning suggest that some have sought to suck up majority rule or the fight for majority rule. And the Progressive Liberal Party is certainly controversial. Our party recognizes that in 1953, our party was formed by mulattoes. Our party celebrates still to this day, Madam Speaker, the work of William Cartwright, H.M. Taylor, Cyril Stevenson. Our party has, over the years, incorporated, brought into all. After Sir Lyndon became prime minister or premier, he made it very clear, our tent is open. Our doors are always open. And we have, over the years, sought to bring the people together. And Norman Solomon, one of the great leaders of our time, said in an interview in 1992 with Wendell Jones, he said that Sir Lyndon could have been disastrous. He could have destroyed. But what he did was he took the whites and the blacks, and even the whites who had dominated the economy, and he worked with them to help us continue to build the economy in unity, in all that we believe in, toward that common loftier goal. And Madam Speaker, just look at our party now. And we continue the struggle, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I move for the adjournment so that we may attend church, Madam Speaker, and to return to the House on the 1st of February, 2023. Move for suspension. Thank you, Honorable Member. It has been moved and seconded. We needed two bites at the apple.
The House is rising to adjourn to Wednesday on our members. Suspend? The House is suspended until Wednesday, 1st of February, 2023. As many are in favor will remain seated. Those opposed will stand. The motion is carried. The business of this House is suspended until Wednesday, 1st of February, 2023 at 10 a.m. All right! Let's see how many people can make it to church.